So you should be able to see my screen right now. Um, if you can see my screen, can you just type in there for me um, that you can see it and then we can uh, go from there. All right, well, no one typed, um, so hopefully everyone can see this, and I, you should be able to. Um, so we'll, we will just, we will start. So the title of the webinar is, you know, why does my lower back and neck always hurt? And these are the two main areas of triathletes, um, as coaching triathletes that are always, always bothering them. We're always trying to figure out ways to, to basically combat it. You know, people get it in high in their neck or right around their shoulder blades, you know, like that part of the back um, on long rides. Usually you don't get it on the trainer, but as soon as you go outside, people tend to get it um, to the point where I've seen it, you know, like we're just putting your head down. It feels like you're being stabbed in the neck or you can't turn your head left to right to check on traffic. Um, and, you know, so we're going to try to assess some of those reasons tonight and understand why and uh, how to fix it and how QT2 is going about fixing it and fixing it um, in sort of a, a taking a step back process and not just going directly to the weight room. Um, so we will get going. So as you, you know, most triathletes, what ends up happening here is, um, is they just foam roll or use the little peanut that people can make out of uh, lacrosse balls and then taping them together. It looks like a peanut, um, you know, but uh, unfortunately just hitting the foam roller or just stretching is really only 50% of the solution. You'll change the mobility and you get that instant relief because we've stretched out the muscles. We've made them longer. Um, so you get instant relief, but we don't fix the problem. You know, we don't fix the reason why it's tight. We don't fix the reason why it hurts and why it, it bothers you. Um, so we are only fixing 50% of the problem. So basically, if we don't backfill with some sort of new motion and teach the body to use that full range of motion and to hold that full range of motion and teach the brain to, you know, use it, um, you're basically never going to fix it. You'll always be foam rolling. You'll always be stretching. You'll never fix the problem. And that's what we're trying to use here tonight. So at QT2, we use the QT2 sort of functional assessment. And it's essentially three steps. Step one is to assess. Step two is to correct. Step three, to reassess. And I like to make sure that, you know, you can use sort of anything you want to fix the problem, as long as it, it's, I like to sort of hit three check marks. Is it anti-extension, which we'll talk about? Am I forcing the correct movement patterns, which we'll talk about? And am I enforcing the exhale and getting the ribs down, which we will also talk about? Those are three check marks. And you'll see this after we talk. Next time you go to the gym, you're gonna see some people doing some things. You're gonna immediately see what's wrong. And you immediately know what the sort of the down the road problems that they're going to have. And then step three is to reassess. Sort of like we do in our training. We assess what we need to do, we then do it, and then we race. And we sit back, we reassess, and then we go back to different corrections and assess it, correct, reassess. And that's what you need to do with these problems as well. And so, you know, what is strength? There's the max strength, there's TRX and there's core stability work, which sort of goes together. Stability is core strength. Uh, at QT2, we sort of go up and down these, these lines. There's really not necessarily any particular one we favor over the other. It's sort of dependent on what the person needs. Uh, the more I'm doing this and the smarter I get about this, the more I realize most people need some serious help with just correct moving patterns and correct breathing patterns before we put them in the gym and put strength and fitness on top of poor movement. Um, poor movement is something that there's tons and tons and tons of research on. 
and it's really worth your time to go ahead and actually you know read about it it's it's really really cool stuff and you'll this it'll make this PowerPoint um, presentation make a little bit more sense for program design and assessment you need to really assess your injury history you know sort of why are you injured and what can we do to fix it via strength and core stability routines run or swim mechanics are always show you where you're deficient in movement patterns and where you move where you're deficient in core strength and and just straight strength you know 80 to 90 percent of the time people who have poor swim mechanics or poor run mechanics they're not necessarily poor it's that their body doesn't know how to move in a different way to give you a quick example if you have left or right crossover while swimming it may not be a pro it may not be a thing that we can just swim drill out of you this may be a your left or right lat might be so tight that it then stops your shoulder from going all the way over it. But if we just continue to do, you know, long vessel sweet spot or or steep and deep drills, we're never going to actually fix the problem. So that the crossover will always be there until we get out of the pool, assess reasons that could force arm crossover and fix those. And then we get back in the pool and the crossover is gone or mitigated. And then we can drill to, you know, help the motor control of doing this crossover for years possibly to get out of it. But until we fix the actual cause of the problem, just doing simple run mechanics or swim mechanics doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fix the problem. And then this is just from a, you know, a very detailed oriented uh, training program, lean BMI if strength could be a limiter, if their athlete has a really small or, or low lean BMI, um, 21 for males and 20 for females. Lower focus, are we going to focus on their lower body? Do they have a weak swimming strength? So we could sh maybe do some more up, upper body focus. And then we just can need to continue to, to develop the strength routine and integrate it into overall season periodization. You know, if movement is good, if everything is good, we're not going to have you in the gym moving massive amount of weights three weeks out from race day because it's not going to help you on race day in three weeks. Maybe in a year, six, eight, ten months, but not you know in the immediate future. And again, we need to continue to assess the athlete limiters and needs dictate strength program. FMS. What does this stand for? What is it? Who created it? Um, I wish I created it, but I'm not that smart. Um, it's by this guy named Greg Cook. He invented it in the early 1990s. Essentially as a way for PTs to have a standardization of assessing people who walked in their door. Um, so everyone that walks into the door of a PT office, of a good PT office, will go through the functional movement screen or FMS. And the true FMS is much bigger than the QT2 functional assessment. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that QT2 doesn't necessarily need. Uh, we can hit seven to nine different things um, and know where the athlete is and or where you are. And if you're a QT2 athlete, uh, your coach can send this to you and you can do it and you can send your results back. And then again, the QT2 functional assessment. Um, our goal is to ensure athletes' movement patterns and joint stability are as good as they can be before putting strength and fitness on top of that. Uh, like I said um, earlier, you know, every athlete needs a certain degree of pel you know, anterior pelvic tilt. Too much is not a good thing. Too little is not a good thing. We need to see where you are. If we, if your anterior or posterior pelvic tilt is too much on day one, 
and we don't assess it and we don't know where you are and we just start throwing strength and fitness on top of it, it's just going to get worse to where it's going to become a limiter. And what I'm trying to do within QT2, because I had to do it for myself over the course of 10 months, is to take a massive step back or say, okay, going to the gym and doing these workouts is not fixing the problem. So what's going to fix the problem? I've been doing the strength program for years. Our problems aren't getting fixed. So let's fix them. And I was really throwing a ton of fitness and a ton of strength on top of improper movement. So I was never going to teach my body how to move better. Uh, maybe not perfectly, but at least better. Um, and, a, you know, Great Cook has this great quote, which I love to use all of the time. And it says, whenever possible, we must separate movement dysfunction from fitness and performance. Aggressive physical training cannot change fundamental mobility and stability problems at an effective rate without also introducing a degree of compensation and increased risk of injury. Triathletes' bodies are amazing at finding where stability is. And it may not be in the correct area. Athletes need stability basically from their chin to their belly buttons. You need massive amount of stability there. If that is very stable, your legs, your feet, your arms, your hands, shoulders will slowly start to become stable. But unless from the chin to the belly button is really stable, other things are not. Where QT2 is incredibly good at, but it's also a downfall to QT2, is the, that we slowly over time build fitness and we also build strength. So we slowly are able to let the body find the, the improper places for stability. If we if QT2 just went straight to tons of intensity and tons of fast running, people would get hurt much faster. But because we are very slow progression of fitness, uh, people tend to be able to come into us with less than ideal movement patterns and not get hurt because their body slowly adapts to moving the wrong way. Um, and it, so that is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. And that's kind of where I am personally over the course of years and years and years of slowly building the volume up. I was able, my body was able to go to the, the, the least, of uh, the least stressful way of movement it could possibly go, which happened to be a very bad way. But I would—I I mean, I haven't missed a day due to injury since I think 2006 or 2005 because of the slow buildup of, of volume and intensity and strength. Had we went straight to it, like I said, I, I would have been on the couch for weeks at a time, uh, probably every year. What actually is joint mobility? It's basically just to the degree to which an you know, to which you can move through a range of motion um, before it's restricted. So can you, you know, can you essentially windmill your arm? Can you bend your knee up, you know, all the way forward and all the way back? Um, that's joint mobility. What is joint stability? The ability to maintain or control joint movement or position. Stability is achieved by the coordinated actions of surrounding tissue in a neuromuscular system. So what you get when you foam roll and stretch is mobility. What you miss is the stability of that. So if you really stretch, you know, if you're foam rolling your calves all the time, you're giving them a ton, ton of mobility, which is why they become less tight. Why they become tight again is because we didn't teach the body to then use and know and to save the full range of motion, which is called stability. This is sort of just another way of looking at the motor control pyramid. You first have mobility, then stability, and then controlled mobility. And you have static dynamic control and dynamic postural control. And that's essentially 
being able to have the control when you're going through the full range of motion, be it swim, bike, and run, um, and being able to hold these patterns and also in daily life. So this is the sort of the QT2 injury resistance process. Again, like I said earlier, we're managing stress across the week or the day, the week, the month, the year. We make slowly make soft tissue durable. And again, with core and stability work, we are able to, not in the best way, which we're in the process of fixing, is core and stability work. Again, to make from your chin to your belly button strong and a stable platform to build off of. Essentially, if you think about it, from your chin to your belly button is the foundation of your house. If it's good, if it's level and perfect, most most of the time going up from it is going to be good, it's going to be level, and it's going to be perfect. If the foundation is off left to right, front to back, your house is going to be off front to back, left to right. And no matter how good you are at other things, it's the base of it is always going to be off. How do we find these weaknesses and how do we compensate for them? You know, strength <laughs> is very quickly um, shown, especially on the bike. A good workout to give and to receive as an athlete is the BST workout, which if you're not a QT2 athlete, is the 3 by 10 best effort at 55 to 65 or 60 RPMs. If an athlete is not able, after a week or two, maybe three, to average middle, top, and then over zone three, the athlete is strength limited. And that, to me, is the, the, the best way to figure it out. If they can't do those three averages, they're strength limited. And it's not the first time they do the workout. Like I said, it's given what, usually it takes about a month. And then we go from there. If they're just continually not able to do it, then we go back and say, okay, let's hit the gym or let's let's push some protein focus while we're doing these bike workouts and see if we can use the sport-specific strength with the protein focus to put on some muscle mass and see if we can get the heart rates up. Um, the conversation is, you know, again, focus work, weight work in the gym, longer base phase, so more zone one work, more miles. Um, increase focus on nutrition, protein focus. The only way to gain muscle is through protein and lots of it. You know, the books and nutritionists will tell you it's not possible. You can't do it. It doesn't matter. You know, the books say no more than this amount of protein. But I can tell you from years of personal experience, the only way to do it is through a massive protein focus and a massive calorie surplus focus. Um, there's really no other way to do it. Um, if you're if you're trying if you're running a a deficit, you're not going to put on muscle mass. So trying to put on muscle mass is something that you do months and months and months out from your A race because you're going to be running a deficit. You're going to put on some body weight, which if once we get back to the correct body fat, will be shown as muscle. But this takes a very, very long time and incredible focus and incredible attention to detail to put on muscle. And that, it, like I said, it takes a very long time. So, you know, you're looking at a pound maybe per year um, of muscle mass or half a pound um, if you're a smaller female trying to also swim, bike, and run. Again, we've sort of covered these to so swim, the bike, and so now we're at the meat and potatoes of the title of this webinar, Why Does My Back and Neck Always Hurt? So this is a picture of a guy essentially in the arrow bars. And what the problem is, you know, I would say all triathletes, and it might be too general, but I've been, you know, I've been coaching triathletes for 10 years now. And I can say everyone I've ever seen, anyone I've ever dealt with, has one of the two of these. And most people 
have lower cross syndrome, which then leads to upper cross syndrome. What upper cross syndrome is, is exactly what this picture shows. The, the back of the neck through the chest muscles are incredibly tight. The neck muscles all the way through the back are incredibly weak. And when you're in the arrow bars for hours at a time, this is why the back of your neck, right where it says tight, hurts. Because your muscles are incredibly tight. And the muscles below it are incredibly weak. And everything sort of is the perfect storm for massive amounts of pain. And the front of your neck is essentially too weak to help hold up your head in the arrow bars. So then everything continues to get tighter and weaker. And this just sort of snowballs to where you're on your bike and you can't turn your head. Or it, it just hurts all of the time. And usually if your neck hurts on the bike, it goes away as soon as you're off of the bike because you, you no longer are using the weak muscles to try to hold your head up. And you know, I know for me, I get to the point where I almost can't turn my head, but as soon as I'm off the bike, it goes away. Unless I'm doing some big, big, big bike focus where then it just always hurts. But in general, this is upper cross syndrome, and I'll show you some ways to fix it. Lower cross syndrome, this is just a Google image picture of lower cross syndrome. And again, this is, you know, um, anterior pelvic tilt. You can see the, the person here in the picture has a pretty decent anterior pelvic tilt. And like I said earlier, every single athlete from baseball players, tennis players, golfers, triathletes, every single athlete needs a degree of this. What happens to triathletes? is it gets significantly worse to where it's a problem and it it becomes worse because you spend time on a bicycle with your you know really tight hip flexors you're swimming you're biking and you're running and swimming and running are very extension based and bike riding is very anti-extension based but then you throw in some poor bike fits really tight calves really tight hip flexors, and then biking almost becomes an, an extension-based exercise as well. And then you get to the point where your body then lives in extension, and then you're just a mess because you can never get yourself out of extension. And then Q at QT2, which I'm, again, getting rid of, we had you doing bicycle crunches, we had you doing uh, supermans and back extensions and hamstring curls, different things to combat the tightness and the weaknesses, but we weren't targeting the actual problem. We were targeting the painful areas, but not the problem. And I'm trying to now help everyone target the problem. This is a, a QT2 athlete that I was helping with. Um, his name's AJ Bauko. He consented to having his picture in this webinar for me. Um, this is what it would look like. So if everyone can jump in the mirror tonight, I'm sure, with um, shorts and a T-shirt or no shirt on, you can see his hip angle from back to front is very, very tilted downwards. You can see the big arch in his lower back. And then his, to where his upper back then arches out towards his arrow bars on his bike in the back of the picture. This is an athlete who has high hamstring pain, tight calves, and his lower back always hurts when he's swimming. Specifically when he's using his core shorts or his pull buoy or after kicking sets. And... If you look at this picture, um, AJ or this guy, you can see because of the pelvic tilt in the forward direction, basically from the tips of his toes to the top of his butt, every muscle is now pulled to the absolute max before you even start exercising. So of course you're always going to have high hamstring, low hamstring, tight calves, tight ankles. All of those things are caused because of this this one problem and um, you know vice versa if you I've never seen it and a single athlete that I've worked with is posterior pelvic tilt 
where this you know he his front would be higher than his lower uh, than his back that would lead to a whole other problems that would lead to really tight hip flexors and really tight quads but this is where most athletes are and this is what we're going to spend the next couple slides trying to fix and i know for me once i hit a few exercises i went from back pain to no back pain in about two weeks um, and what you're going to start with doing is you're going to start with foam rolling mid to upper back and um, it's called your thoracic back and essentially what you do there is you just you know have your butt and your feet on the ground a foam roller at your low like upper to mid back and you just put your hands behind your back and just roll over the foam roller and it should feel absolutely amazing your back may even crack and you just want to foam roll that you know turn to the side to hit your lats which are now probably pretty tight as well and that's going to help slowly loosen up the upper back and and then we once we have it loose once we have we give it the mobility we then do some stability exercises to help then use that length so foam roll the upper lower back thoracic back thoracic spine your t-spine are all different words for it spend some time there spend a few days just really digging in there getting the mobility um, really really dig into it you know for a couple days you may even go to get a massage where you they um, they grasp in your upper back and mid back when you're in your when you're on your hands and your knees and you're really trying to tuck your butt and push your sort of your shoulder blades down and that again if you do that again hands and knees so you're arched over and you tuck your butt as sort of underneath you as much as you can you push off the table with your forearms to really round out your back and then they can um, grasp in you know your 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 lats your upper back your mid back right around your spine and that'll help loosen everything up in the correct posture um, you know this he then to work the front you really really need to get someone to dig into your hip flexors because they are tight you need someone to dig in there give it the mobility um, to sort of loosen up a little bit you know i can show you in a, a couple slides later i can show you you know the, the 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 normal hip flexor stretch where you have one foot in front of you the other you know and your knee on the ground and you lean forward is really really good the key there is again to make sure you're tucking your butt and getting your ribs down. So almost ex ex really exhaling out so your ribs are down. Not, you know, you don't need your back arched and your ribs out and a big sort of C in your back, sort of like AJ is here, and you're trying to then and you're trying to hit your hip flexors. Cause at that point, all you're doing is you're not doing anything. You're you're in extension. You're not hit, you're not targeting the correct muscles. So there, you just again tuck your butt, keep your ribs down, and actually lean backwards. Very very slight. If you're tucking your butt enough and keeping your ribs down, trust me, you will feel it from your hip flexor all the way to your knee. Um, that's the typical um, hip flexor stretch. You know, everyone has you lean forward. If you do it right, you tuck your butt, ribs down, lean back. You will feel it. That is an amazing, amazing mobility exercise. And then I'll show you what the stability exercise is after that. <clears throat> Again, now to the correctives, the correct breathing patterns. Breathing patterns set the foundation to which the body will move from. If breathing is not ideal, before you even move, you are in a weakened position to start movement from. Um, if breathing is not normalized, no other movement pattern can be. I think the, one of the best breathing exercises is to lay on your back with your feet on a wall or on a couch so your knees are 90 degrees and your feet or your, you know, your, your heels are on the couch or on the wall. Tuck your butt, roll your back again so your back is then in a neutral position. It's not arched so you're not in extension. You're on the ground. And grab a balloon and breathe into the balloon and try to blow the balloon up in three breaths.
breath. So you need to breathe in through your nose and exhale forcefully into the balloon. If you cannot blow the balloon up in three breaths, your breathing patterns are not good. And you need to become better. And that's a great, great tool to use. I use I do balloon stuff one to two times a week. If I feel my back starting to, to bother me again, boom, I grab a balloon and I will do I will do this bear with a balloon. And I'll come back and explain this, but I breathe into a balloon and boom, things start to get better. So this is the first corrective breathing patterns. The two biggest mistakes that I see people making, and people do it all the time, you see it at the gym, is crunches. Try, they, people try to do crunches or sit-ups to help reduce lower back and help make their core strong. Uh, crunches are, are probably, they're tied for worst for the worst exercise, um, specifically for triathletes, but for everybody else, unless you're trying to have a six-pack to win a six-pack competition, which is not what we're not, you know, at, as triathletes, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to go as fast as we possibly can, whatever that is for you, to the finish line. And crunches will not help you get there. The core muscles, we're trying to get them to work together to stabilize the lower back and actually resist movement. So why do we do them? To do an exercise that does the opposite. Excessive use of the core to work as a mover and not as a stabilizer leads to low back injuries. So just sort of take a minute and think about that. It's not a good exercise. If the crunches are the, are the number one worst exercise, back extensions are 1A of the worst exercises to do. And we already spend, athlete, as athletes, um, tons and tons of hours in back extension. Why do we need to make it stronger? Why do we need to take the muscles that help force back extension and make them stronger and then just lead into a worse back extension? If we want to make our low back stronger, there's a, there's a lot of exercises that we can do to make them stronger and not put a ton of pressure on our lower back and not strengthen the, the muscles that tend to cause the back extension. So I just listed off a couple, the kettlebell deadlifts, um, offset, one leg, dead, one leg deadlifts, um, trap bar deadlifts, plate deadlifts, reverse lunges. Um, reverse lunges are kind of hard to find. That's an exercise I do. I didn't really know the name of it. Um, and there's really no good video. I'm going to show you a picture and I'm going to try to explain it. So your best bet would be to write it down because this massively 100% worked for me. Um, so the big thing is there's no isolation of the muscles when we're doing um, these type of deadlifts, or if we do um, hip hikes with a, you know, a, a, the one of the best hip hike exercises is to basically take a bench press bar, put 45 pounds on it so it's off the ground and roll it over you and put it like basically right on your hip or on your belly button. Um, you may need like, you know, they have like that foam pad that you put on your neck when you're squatting. You can put it on there and then you just do a hip hike um, with that bar and you really, really, really load it with some serious amount of weight. Um, the, the only reason I didn't put hip hikes on here as a fix is because depending on how bad the posterior, the anterior tilt is of your hips, it's very, very hard to get into. And it's very, very hard to do correctly without having someone watch you. And I was trying to add some exercises that you could do on your own. Um, but essentially, we don't isolate the muscles and the body works as one functional unit. Uh, the big thing here is that you have to make sure your butt is tucked and the back is flat, ribs are down, and you're belly breathing. So that means when you breathe in through your nose, your your sides and your stomach expands. It, you don't breathe into your rib cage, you breathe into your stomach. And when I say butt tucked, I mean like you're squeezing your butt so it's underneath you and sort of rolled up. So underneath and rolled up. That's the best way to explain it and your back becomes flat. And by flat I mean you're 
the the um the anterior pelvic tilt is you take it you've taken the, the pelvic tilt out by forcefully tucking your butt down and up. So this is what I would call the reverse lunge. Um, this is the best picture I could find, and the only thing you're gonna modify you're gonna modify two things here. You're gonna modify the starting position of the back and the starting position of the back foot. The back foot well, that I have found for me personally, if I have my toes there, because as a triathlete we have teached our body or taught our body to cheat the system in every possible way to find the easiest way of movement. Um, so if I find if my toes are there, I push off with my toes a little bit. So I just put you know the ball, the uh, the like the front of my foot on the ground. So my foot would be flat here. My toes would not be on the ground. I have the front of my toes on the ground, and I kind of drag my foot up. And that way, there's no there's no pushing with that leg up. So the the body difference here is to force the anti-extension and to force the movement in a correct way for someone that has serious pelvic tilt is this person would, would roll their back forward so that their chest is closer to the leg in front. So you basically just lean over so that your face is down. And what that does is that 100% takes the back totally out of the equation. So does that make sense? So you roll the back, you breathe, you force a breath out so that your ribs are down, your foot is on the ground so that you know the, the front of your foot is on the ground. And then you take your heel and you pull, try to pull your heel towards you. So your entire body weight is actually pulled up with your heel and you should feel it in your hamstring and in your butt. Another way for that I found that my body was cheating on it is the toes on the front foot would use I would use those a little bit. So I actually try to pull my toes up a little bit as well. So no toes on the front and toes on the ground in the back. And you need to dig into your heels so that every whatever weight you're using and plus your body is pulled up with your heel. And the first time, the first couple times you do this, you don't need any weight. But as you get stronger, you're going to have to really load it up. You know, if you have a 50 or 75 pound kettlebell, um, I've been using a 45 pound plate that I just sort of cross, you know, I hold cross armed against my body. And I lean forward and I pull myself up. Um, I'll do three sets of 10, three sets of 12. Um, I use the weight every other day. And every and then on the opposite days, I just do them at home with no weight. Maybe do it fifty or a hundred times, um, just randomly throughout the day. The progression of this is to progress to where you're finishing in a posture like the person in the picture. The first few weeks, I would finish almost in the same starting position where you're leaned over until you slowly get your back out of extension when you're living. If you're back, if you're still in extension and just living, keep keep hunched over. Hunch it over as much as you need for as long as you need it. That's that's okay. It's actually better. If you start to be like this gray person and straight or lean back, you're just reinforcing the bad movement and the bad movement patterns, and you're not fixing anything. Uh, I would do this all day long instead of the TRX. Um, single leg squat I would do this all day long instead of hamstring curls anytime you have a hamstring curl do this anytime you have a TRX suspended lunge do this anytime you have a TRX sprinter start do this it's better it's m closer to running and it's a much better more targeted exercise for the hamstrings and the glutes and you if you do it correctly you're also really opening up the hip flexor on the other leg. So you're getting instant mobility, instant stability. Nothing beats that. This is one of the basically the best exercise you can do. 
you absolutely crush it and do not be afraid to really load it up with weights load it up load it up load it up and you will really start to see us see it in the mirror of your hips slowly starting to come um, back into alignment you should start to feel it you should feel it when you're running you should feel it in everyday life that things are slowly getting better Core stabilization protocols, start with the bear, go to the plank, roll out with the ball on your knees, roll out with, with on your toes, and the rollout wheel. The rollout wheel is the best anti-extension thing on the market, but 99% of the people using it shouldn't be using it because they're into their lower back. They should be basically on the bear first and then there. This is the bear. It may look like you're on your hands and your knees, which is the starting position. The bear is hit this gentleman's knees are about an inch to an inch and a half off of the ground. That's the bear. Anyone who can hold a plank for three minutes, try the bear. Give it, I, you'll be dead in 45 or 50 seconds. This is an amazing, amazing exercise. Simply because you are 100% taking the back out of the situation. The back is not involved at all. This is total core strength. Um, so again, the bear, start exactly, think of this position as a starting position with your knees on the ground. Then you would pull your knees about an inch off the ground, making sure your butt is tucked and holding. Then the, another, a great progression of this is to, again to keep this position Drop your head, so like almost looking at your chest, and breathe into a balloon. Three full breaths, trying to blow the balloon up. Amazing exercise. What this gentleman is doing is pushing off the ground as hard as he can with his hands to really bring the shoulder blades down, and he's tucking his butt as hard as he can underneath him. Underneath, pulling the shoulder blades up, and he gets this position. A nice arch back, knees off the ground. And this is a, an amazing exercise. Um, a great exercise just to help with the lower back is to take this position, keep your knees on the ground, and just do this. Just sit there. After you do the, the T-spine foam rolling, do this position with your knees on the ground. Tuck your butt, push your arms away, and you will feel it in your lower back, upper back. It's that At that point, you're giving it the stability after you gave it the mobility. The plank, once you get good at this and you've done the you've done the reverse lunges and you're slowly getting yourself out of extension, the plank is an amazing exercise. Again, um, you could they have an, the next variation of this would be the, the hard plank where you're you're forcing your elbows and you're trying to pull your elbows and your toes to each other at the same time, hold it for about 10 seconds. I mean it's you don't necessarily try to get a strong chest. By, take, by loading up the bench press bar, pulling it straight up, and holding it. So we wouldn't do that with core muscles either. So if you think about this, even you, like when you're bench pressing, you're going up and you're going down, up and down, up and down. With this, you would, you know, you'd force your elbows and your toes, and you try to bring them together very forcefully while exhaling forcefully. Hold for five to ten seconds, and just repeat that. Essentially, you know, maybe three sets of ten. Pull your toes and your elbows together, and you will feel it you're in your in your core contracting. But again, we're it's a whole body movement, and it's a whole body contraction. Um, exactly what we're trying to do. Once you have this, you can do the the rollout on the ball. As long as you're not going into extension, you roll out onto the ball. Um, and again, this is starting to give some movement into it. We're trying to become stable in an unstable environment. But this is going to take some time. You should spend some time doing the bear, doing the reverse lunge before you go to here. Because if you if you do this with extension, again, you're, you're just reinforcing bad movement patterns. On a complete side note, if you have one of these balls and your back is bothering you, basically just lay on the ball. And if you, if you can get your knees and your elbows off of the ground, 
you know, and just sort of stabilize yourself or you can use a chair if you have a chair that's high enough and just lay on it. And if you, as long as your arms and knees are off the ground, it'll, it will, you'll get yourself out of extension. You'll roll everything out and you'll, your back only needs a few pounds of sort of like pulling pressure that your knees can provide to help release some sort of pressure in your upper and lower back. And so you can just take a chair and sort of lay on the chair, you know, your chest and you basically like to your hips on the seat of the chair, dangle your knees and your arms, and that'll help um, release some pressure. Again, the very best is the rollout wheel, but again, you have to set yourself up perfectly. This guy's position is pretty decent. You'd almost want to see a bigger arch in his back and his butt a little bit more tucked before he went into the rollout position. Um, but it was the best picture I could find online. But this is the best anti-extension movement out there. But again, a lot of people um, just aren't there yet. But this is the, the gold standard, and this is where you want to try to progress to. Beware. Everyone has different levels of tissue tolerance. Elite, elite athletes generally have higher tissue tolerance, meaning they don't break down as easily, which is usually why they're also elite athletes, because they don't miss training time. Uh, but once they do break down, rehab attempts can be way harder because a defunction is so much more ingrained and there is so much strength built on top of it. This really goes for a ton of athletes. You know, any QT2 athlete who puts in a decent amount of volume for a couple of years, what you know, I don't want, you know, whether you're elite, whether, you know, no matter how you define elite or not, if you've put in a, a decent amount of volume over a long period of years without being injured, you have very high tissue tolerance and it's going to take a big effort on the rehab side to fix it. You know, what one thing I tell everybody is it took them, you know, I'm just throwing out numbers here. It took a million steps for the defunction to be set. Rehab is not going to happen with 10 minutes a night of foam rolling and stretching. You need to make it a big part of your day. Um, every day, all year, it needs to be a big, big, big part. Um, otherwise, it'll never be fixed. You know, for most people, if once it gets to a point where like AJ was, yeah, we're going to spend the year managing it. We're never going to fix it throughout the year. Because if training and his the body just goes to that, we're never going to fix it. The only way we're going to fix it is next off season when we take eight to ten weeks off and we don't do anything but fix the problem. That's correct. Eight to ten weeks of doing this every single day is the only time we're going to make progress fixing this. AJ has one of the worst that I've seen, but. That's where people go. That's like that's the gold standard of pelvic tilt. You don't want to be there, but that's where people get to through core exercises, through back extensions, through training, through not doing anything to fix it until it gets there. And then the only way to fix it is basically to take massive amounts of time off, let the body slowly start to unsort of screw itself. And then you slowly put it back together. You slowly tighten the screws in the correct manner. Um, so that's the sort of the PowerPoint. Um, I can definitely open this up to uh, questions. If
if there's um if there's any questions on that, you know, you guys can definitely um type them out or I can even try to unmute everybody. Um If there's any questions, type them in the chat, and um, and um, so there doesn't appear to be any questions. So there doesn't appear to be any questions. So I, I thank everybody for coming, and uh, we'll see you guys there. Have a good night.